Hi, this is Alex from Groove the Entertainment. Today we got another record to play for you. Today record, The Ivory City and the Fairy Princess Part 2 from 1977. So let's get started. The next time the old woman visited the palace, Gulizar called one of her servants and ordered her to rush into the room while she was talking to the old woman. And if the old woman asked what was the matter, she was to say that the king's elephants had gone mad and were running through the city and the bazaar in every direction and destroying everything in their path. The servant obeyed and the old woman, fearing that the elephants might go and push over her hut and kill the prince and his companion, begged the princess to let her go. Now, Gulnazar had obtained a charmed swing that landed whoever sat in it at the place where they wished to be no matter where that place was. She ordered a servant to bring the swing, and when it was brought, she asked the old woman to sit in it and wish that she were back in her hut. The old woman did this and was at once carried through the air quickly and safely to her hut, where she found her two guests safe and sound. Praise the Lord, you're all right. I thought that both of you would be killed by this time. The royal elephants have got loose and were running every which way. When I heard this, well, I was very concerned about you. So the princess gave me this charmed swing to come back in. But come, let's go outside before the elephants arrive and knock down the place. No, do not you believe in this, because it is just a joke. They have played a little trick on you, you know. And the old woman thought this was true because, well, no elephants had come that way. And the advisor's son told the prince that the princess was signaling him and that soon they would meet. When the moon was most slight in the sky, the prince and the advisor's son seated themselves in the swing and wished themselves within the grounds of the palace. In an instant they were there, and there too was the person the prince desired to see, standing next to one of the palace gates and longing to see the prince every bit as much as he was longing to see her. What a happy meeting they had. Right then and there, the prince and Gulizar betrothed themselves to each other and considered themselves engaged to be married. Then they parted, the one going to the hut and the other to the palace both of them feeling better than they ever had before. From that time on, the prince visited Gulizar every day and returned to the hut every night. One morning, Gulizar begged him to stay with her always. She was constantly worried that something might happen to him. Perhaps robbers might kill him or sickness attack him and she would see him no more. She could not bear to think of living without him. The prince explained that there was nothing to worry about and said that he ought to return to his hut at night because he had left his home and country and risked his life all for him. And besides, if it hadn't been for his friends, he would never have met her. Gulizar agreed, but she was determined in her heart to get rid of the advisor's son as soon as possible. A few days after their conversation, she ordered one of her maids to make a fish stew. She gave special orders that a certain poison was to be mixed into it while cooking, and as soon as it was ready, the cover was to be placed on the saucepan so that the poisonous steam might not escape. When the stew was ready, she sent it at once with a servant to the advisor's son with this message. Gulizar, the princess, sends you a gift in the name of her dead uncle. When he received this gift, the advisor's son thought that the prince had praised him to the princess, and therefore she had remembered him with this present. So he sent back his thanks and gratitude. When it was dinner time, he took the saucepan of stew and went out to eat it by the stream. Taking off the lid, he tossed it aside on the grass and then washed his hands. During the minute or two that he was washing, the green grass under the lid of the saucepan turned quite yellow and then black. He was astonished. And, deciding that there might be poison in the stew, he took a little and threw it to some crows that were hopping around. The moment the crows ate the stew, they fell down dead. Praise the power that saved me, that preserved me from death once again. But I must speak to the prince. 
could he have none of this? That evening, when the prince returned from his palace visit, he noticed that the advisor's son was very quiet and sad. The prince put his hand on his friend's shoulder and said, Oh, what is the matter? Are you lonely because I am away so much of the time and you have no other friends here? So the advisor's son knew that the prince had nothing to do with sending the stew, and therefore told him what had happened. Look at this. In this handkerchief is some stew that the prince has sent me this morning. And it is terrible. It is full of poison. I was so fortunate to discover it in time. Oh, my brother, who could have done this? For who could hate a man as fine as you? I must tell you. It's the princess, Gulizar. Oh, oh no. Yes, yes, no, yes no, listen. No, no. Listen to me. The next time you meet with her, I beg you to take some snow with you. Where you're going to find it around here, I don't know, but... Before seeing the princess, put a little of it into both of your eyes. It will make your eyes tear. And Guliza will ask, why is it that you are weeping? Tell her that you weep for the loss of your friend who died suddenly this morning. And wait, take with you also this wine and this shovel. And when you have pretended intense grief at the death of your friend, ask the princess to drink a little of the wine. It is quite strong and will quickly put her in a deep sleep. And then, while she is snoozing, heat this little shovel and mark her back with it. She'll feel nothing, I assure you. Remember to bring back the shovel again and also take her pearl necklace and bring that back with you too. I love pearls. Now don't be afraid to do as I say because your happiness depends on these actions. I will arrange that your marriage with Guliza will be accepted by her father, the king, and all the court shall approve as well. The prince promised that he would do just as the advisor's son had told him, and he kept his promise. On the following night, after he had returned from his visit to the princess, he and the advisor's son, taking the horses and the bags of gold, went to the graveyard about a mile or so away. It was arranged that the advisor's son should pretend to be an Indian holy man, a fakir, and the prince should pretend to be the fakir's disciple and servant. In the morning, when the princess had awakened, she felt a smarting pain in her back and noticed that her pearl necklace had disappeared. She went at once and told the king of her lost necklace, but said nothing to him about the pain in her back. The king was very angry when he heard of the theft and had it announced throughout all the city and surrounding country. The advisor's son heard the announcement which said there would be a handsome reward for anyone who discovered the person who stole the necklace. But he did not appear worried. Oh, don't worry, my friend. But go and take this necklace and try to sell it at the bazaar. So the prince agreed that this whole story was rather bizarre but he took it to a goldsmith and asked if he would buy it. The goldsmith said that he would, but he had to go and get the money first. The prince waited and waited, till at last the goldsmith returned and with him the police, who at once took the prince into custody on the charge of stealing the necklace. The police asked how he came into possession of the necklace. Why, a fakir whose servant I am gave it to me to sell at the bazaar, and if you'll allow me, I'll show you where he is. So the prince took the police to the place where he had left the advisor's son, and there they found the fakir with his eyes shut and engaged in prayer. After some time, when he had finished his devotions, the police asked him to explain how he had got the princess's necklace. Oh, no, no, I, I don't wish to tell you. Uh, but if you call the king here, I will tell him face to face. So some of the police went to the king, and told him what the fakir had said. The king came at once, and seeing the fakir so serious and earnest in his devotions, he was afraid to arouse his anger in case his action should make heaven punish him. So the king placed his hands together in the attitude of one who asks advice from a holy man, and he asked the fakir, oh, How did you get my daughter's necklace? Or last night, we were sitting here by this worshipping when a ghoul you know a ghoul dressed as a princess 
came and dug up a body that had been buried a few days before. On seeing this, I was filled with anger and hit her back with a shovel, which lay on the fire at the time. While running away from me, her necklace got loose and dropped to the ground. You wonder at these words, but I know I can't prove them. Examine your daughter, and you will find the mark of the burn on her back. Go now, and if what I say is true, send the princess to me, and I will punish her. The king hurried back to the palace, and at once ordered the princess's back to be examined. Your Highness, I have examined the princess's back, as you commanded. And, Your Highness, it is so. The burn mark is there, said the maidservant. The king became furious. His own daughter, a ghoul? I command the girl to be put to death. She must be a changeling. She's no daughter of mine. The princess at the time couldn't be reached. She was at a dance, changeling partners all night long. But his advisers argued with him and said that he should send his daughter to the fakir as he had promised, and the fakir would decide what her punishment should be. The king agreed. And so the princess was taken to the graveyard. The fakir said at once what should be done with her. I know. You must let her be shut up in a cage and be kept near the grave that she desecrated. This was done. And in a little while, the fakir and his disciple and the princess were left alone in the graveyard. Night had fallen by this time, and the fakir and his disciple threw off their disguise and, taking their horses and bags, appeared before the cage. They released the princess, rubbed some ointment over the burn on her back, and then sat her upon one of their horses behind the prince. Away they rode, fast and far, and by morning they were able to rest and discuss their plans in safety. The advisor's son showed the princess some of the poison stew she had sent him and asked whether she had repented her action. Then the princess wept and confessed that she had been crazy with love and jealousy, and that now she realized that he was her greatest helper and friend. She said that he might kill her if he liked, for she was not worthy of the prince. But the prince and the advisor's son had disagreed, and explained that she had become bewitched by her own love spell, which she had cast upon the prince long before at the lake, but now neither of them were under a spell. They were really and truly in love. The princess was happy to be in love without the aid of any artificial spell, for it felt better that way, and she renounced her fairy powers that had got her into trouble. The advisor's son sent a letter to the king's chief advisor, his father, telling him of all that had happened to the prince and himself since they had left their country. When the advisor read his son's letter, he went and informed the king. The king was still angry. He caused a letter to be sent to the prince and his friend, in which he ordered them not to return, but to send a letter to Gulizar's father and inform him of everything. And the prince wrote the letter as the advisor's son had told him to. On reading the letter, Gulizar's father was much enraged with his advisers and other officials for not discovering the presence in his country of these important visitors. And as he was especially anxious to impress the prince and his friend, he ordered the execution of some of his advisers on a certain date. For Gulizar's father was a stupid man, and he thought the executions would impress the prince with his power and importance. The king wrote a letter back to the prince and invited him to stay at the palace, promising to arrange a marriage with Gulizar as soon as possible. The prince and the advisor's son most happily accepted the invitation and received a very fancy welcome. The marriage soon took place, and after a few weeks, the king gave them presents of horses and camels and elephants and jewels and rich cloths, and told them to travel to their own country, for he was sure the king would now receive them. As part of their farewell celebrations, Gulizar's father had planned the execution of his advisers. But the prince and his friend pleaded for these men's lives, and the king listened to their pleas and restored the advisers to their former positions. The chief advisor of Gulizar's father was so grateful, for he had been one of the condemned, that he offered his daughter in marriage to the prince's companion. This daughter was quite beautiful, and she and the advisor's son fell immediately in love, and so they were married. Then the prince and his bride, and the advisor's son and his bride, accompanied by a troop of soldiers and their brides, and a large number of camels and elephants and horses carrying very much treasure, left for their own land. 
On their way, they passed the tower of the robbers who had imprisoned them months before. With the help of the soldiers, they knocked it to the ground, chased off all the robbers, and took the treasure which they had there. After several days' journey, they reached their own country. And when the king saw his son's beautiful wife and all his treasures, he at once forgave him and ordered him to enter the city and live wherever he liked. From that day on, the prince met with no trouble and had much joy in his life. He became a favorite of the king and in time succeeded to the throne. The advisor's son became his chief advisor and together they ruled the country for many, many years in peace and in happiness. So that was the Ivory City and the Fairy Princess, part two, for 1977. So if you like, subscribe, share, and comment, and have a groovy day. We'll have another video coming out real soon.